everyone, welcome to another edition of your program, Harona. I am Harona Drame. This week, I have somebody who I have uh, seen from the distance, and I've seen his growth, his advancement. He is an engineer and works with machines, coding and communicating with them. He's also added certain flavors. He's written a book, and uh, I see him more or less as a motivational speaker these days. Welcome to my guest, Mr. Seku Kamara. I'm not going to mistake <laughs> and not put the Mr. before the name. Thank you very much. <laughs> I cut that. That's an inside joke. I'm glad that you cut that. I got it. But thank you very much, uh, Harun. Uh, it's a privilege and honor to be on your uh, show today. And thank you very much for having me. Thank you and welcome home, Mr. Semester. <laughs> no, now we're going to have an issue with that. I will not accept the semester talk. <laughs> No. I refuse to be called a semester. You know, uh, semesters pay 400, locals pay 200. You're still paying, so you might as well take a tag. I will not accept the semester tag. Semester comes with a certain requirements. I don't feel those requirements yet. You, to be a semester, you need to have a certain kind of a bling yes. that comes with it. I don't own bling blings. I cannot call myself a, You need to have a certain type of a car. I don't own that type of car. I'm not a semester yet. You need to own a certain type of clothes. Mm -hmm. Daddy Sol. Mm -hmm. I don't own Daddy Sol yet. So no, I'm, I'm still a few years away from being semester. I'm working on it now. When I grow up, I would love to be a semester. You are dodging the bullet, <laughs> <laughs> but that's fine. <laughs> uh, we'll, generally, we'll start the program profiling my right. guest from childhood. And uh, I've read a little bit about you and yours, mm -hmm. but do you want to share it with our public? Where did you grow up? Um, I grew up from uh, Banjo. Uh, 47 Tufts, you then remember my street, stand up Banjo, stand up Tobacco Road, uh, Tally uh, okay. and um, that's where I was born and raised. And then um, so later on in life, I moved to Old Joshua with my mom mm -hmm. and my uh, little siblings. Um, again, I spent some very good formidable years of my life in Old Joshua, and that kind of gave me a diverse background. That's the first time I kind of live with. Uh, people from other religions. In Banjul and Tobacco, all my immediate surroundings were more of Muslim children. Mm -hmm. But in Old Joshua, that's the first time I had to live with a Christian uh, 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 kids from other families. Mm -hmm. And I had to spend first communion and confirmations so to celebrate those things with them, not only Christmas, but also after I did their weddings and know how Christian weddings are conducted. And I had to go to funerals and know how Christian funerals are conducted and all of that. So that kind of gave me a different sense of understanding of the Gambia that we have, the sense of toil and the, the, uh, the, the unity and the, everything that we have, um, and the comradeship and all of that. The yeah. childhood experiences? Yeah. Yeah. The challenges, what were some of the challenges that you had uh, gone through that uh, shaped you today? Um, I would say uh, growing up in Albert Market, uh, growing up... There are no houses at Albert Market. <laughs> but, <laughs> are there houses? There are they houses. Have apartments there. They, but if you spend uh, 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. almost every day in Albert Market, it's become home eventually, yeah. right? And every kid dream is to play, is to go out and play with your friends and whatnot. But my mom used to have to go to the market in the morning. Mm -hmm. And she had to carry me on her back, and I'm at the market with her, and she don't come back home until like 8, 9 p.m. in the evening. So my entire childhood pretty much is spent at the Albert Market. And today we call it bullying, but back then we didn't even know what it was called. But I would get picked on by other kids uh, for always being at the market, for uh, calling me, see who do to you, right? Mm -hmm. Selling palm oil at the market. That was very challenging. Today is funny looking back, but back then, Oh man, like you go to school and kids tell you you smell like duty and mm -hmm. uh, you don't use lotion, you use duty on your skin and all of that. Mm -hmm. That was tough. I'll get into a lot of fights. And I'm not ashamed to say this, I lost a bunch of fights. <laughs> <laughs> no, you wouldn't. Man, I <laughs> took a lot of L's in my life because that was my only go to. Every time you call me, say we do it, or say something funny about me or my mom, and Squire up, let's go. Let's right? do it. Let's do it. I don't care how big you are. I don't care how many of you are. Let's go. Mm -hmm. And I ended up taking a lot of fights, and I realized that I was losing a bunch. So I just stopped fighting. What I would do, I just go into the restroom and just cry, and then come out and go back to class. And I did it until I completed elementary school. So yeah, that was really uh, tough and challenging. But at the same time, 
uh, those moments were also some of the best moments of my life uh, looking back today mm -hmm. because it gave me a different sense of understanding and appreciation mm -hmm. of the government that we have today. Mm -hmm. the, uh, in, at the market, I saw and see our men and women who will go to the market every day with mm -hmm. nothing in their hands but faith in God. And they have no money to feed their families back home. Their luck depends on the, uh, the, uh, whatever luck the guards of the market provide them with that day. If they make sales, they may eat. If there is no sales, some of them may go home hungry. Those are real uh, situations that I have witnessed. I have seen grown men and women cover their eyes and cry mm -hmm. because their children are surrounded and they don't have food to feed them. And I've seen those things in person myself. So at the same time, I also see the faith in those people. Every day they keep coming back. That's not a single day that they don't show up and fight and keep on walking. And that kind of build, that kind of go get a spirit in me that no matter how hard it is, no matter how tough it is, you always saw the next day. So those are very uh, 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 great experiences that I learned as a child, uh, spending time around uh, much more older and experienced people at the market. And this is a very good time to take a break. We'll be back and more with my guest, Mr. Seku Kamara. <laughs> Welcome back to your program, Harona. And my guest this week is uh, Seiko Kamara. I used the mister. I've not used that for anyone before. But I know he insists on being referred to as mister. And uh, this is an inside joke that I've picked on and uh, I will respect it for the next uh, 20 minutes. Now, we talked about your childhood. Um, mm -hmm. I understand you're now an engineer. Yes. I, these are not professions that uh, Gambians are very well known for. Mm -hmm. I mean, most of us, my generation, mm -hmm. I went all the way out of high school and mm -hmm. I've never interacted with a computer, not especially in school. Right. So how do you get this passion to do this and then make a career out of it? See, usually I would love to have like an inspiring story behind this, right? This is like the big deal, how, why I went into engineering and all that, but unfortunately I don't. It was simple. I went to college, I went to school to be a uh, business administration major. Thank you, this is right. something we do. Right, mm -hmm. so I was, but I was broke. I went to school broke, I didn't have no money. My parents could afford to pay school for me to go to school. Mm -hmm. So I went to school and I got in there late. I didn't have money to register on time. So all the freshman courses were filled. Uh, and I didn't have an uh, opportunity to get into any of the freshman classes. The only freshman classes that were open were the engineering courses because uh, Historically, I went to HBCU, a historical black college, mm -hmm. and African-American students usually stay, for, stay away from the STEM sciences. They're usually in the liberal arts. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, um, can I just jump into one of the classes until the other students drop out of the uh, business classes so that I can switch back? And my advisor was like, yeah, you can do it. So I'm like, okay. I got into a visual basic class. Mm -hmm. It was a computer science class. And I, I never, up until that point, I never even had an email account. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know how to send an email, uh, an email let alone uh, uh, write a code. But I was in the class, and the first two weeks, I improved a lot. And the professor was very helpful and liked my growth. And he was like, maybe you should consider doing this. You seem to kind of have a niche for this. And uh, the semester ended. I ended up with an A in that class. Mm -hmm. I went to my advisor, and I asked him, um, what is the tuition difference between being a a uh, business student and an engineering student is like, it's pretty much the same. You have a flat student rate. It don't matter what you study in the school. It's the same tuition. Mm -hmm. Now I ask him, how much does an engineer make average mm -hmm. compared to a business administrator when they graduate? He's like, well, engineers make significantly more than business administrators. I'm like, sign me up, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all in for the money. So <laughs> me the money. Sign me up, baby. Let's yeah. go. <laughs> so that's how I ended up being an engineer. He said the same tuition amount. Mm -hmm. And I have a better chance of getting a better job and getting paid more money. Hey, let's go. I grew then up in Albert Market. <laughs> yeah, but um, <laughs> now looking back mm -hmm. and the, the testimony of an African immigrant, right. we're going to get into that mm -hmm. later on mm -hmm. as a writer, mm -hmm. as a motivational speaker. Right. Because I follow you now. I mm -hmm. see your, your, your professional mm -hmm. background. Right. And then you're building other professions around it, right. if you will. Right. I don't, I'm not seeing the icing on the top yet, but I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sure you're working on a surprise icing on top of that huge cake you're building now. Yeah. So where did you drive the motivation to now want to share 
your story, your person, mm -hmm. your journey? Mm -hmm. um, engineers, the whole and the entire thesis behind engineering is problem solving. That's the role of an engineer. You're supposed to solve problems. Mm -hmm. And um, solving problems doesn't necessarily mean just holding a nail and a hammer and going at, going at it. Right? Solving ideas sometimes can come through dialogue, through conversations. And um, one of our biggest challenges in my generation is that uh, we grew up without uh, role models around us. Like you said, you went to high school, you never met an engineer day in your life. Mm -hmm. Neither do I. Mm -hmm. Never met an engineer day in my life. Uh, we saw successful people uh, before. We have no idea how they arrived at their success, right? Mm -hmm. So the question becomes, once we have the opportunity to accomplish things, how do we go back and relay that story back to the young people? How can we document it for the young people now they can have a roadmap that they can follow so that they won't uh, suffer from the same things that we suffered from? That's one of the reasons. But also, um, and I will chime in my writing skills here a little bit. Mm -hmm. Chinua Chebe said that the role of an African writer is three things. One, you must have an historial, a historian to safeguard our past. Two, you must serve as an, uh, an observer and also an analyzer of our current, uh, 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 of our present situation, more like a critic of our pre uh, present situation. And you must always report back of the, uh, what, you, what your findings are. And the third one is, you have to serve as a mentor, guiding our future forward. And none of these things have anything to do with age. All it has to do with understanding. You have to understand, you have the skill set. You go re reflect back and see what has been done. Analyze what, have, what we are doing today in the future and forecast something that we can learn and move forward in the future. And these are the things that I try to put together. And the best way to do it is to try to tap into young people, motivate them, inspire them. Because I believe that if we can touch young people early on in their lives, we can t mold them to become anything that we, uh, they wish to happen in this world. Any problem that we wish to solve in the future, mm -hmm. You don't wait until in the future and solve it. You look back yesterday, I looked at the young people today, and start preparing them to fix those problems for, uh, for us tomorrow that we're going to face before they even occur. And this is why I chose to be a motivational speaker to make sure that I inspire other young people who do not have the opportunities that I, uh, uh, that I lack growing up to make sure that I give them the opportunities that I don't have and so they can use it and add on their toolbox. And hopefully one day they'll be way better than both you and I. And when they pass it on, our future will be much, much stronger and better. People don't usually see you. No. Now, being an engineer, a backroom person, mm -hmm. and now you're coming mm -hmm. front desk. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a transition it takes. I mean, you have to be beside yourself, or you have to divide your boring your coding self, right. and your now active motivational self. Yes. <laughs> How? Matter of fact, you are right. As an engineer, if you are known, you are a terrible engineer. Because the only time people remember a network or infrastructure engineer is when things are going bad. If your computer is working, you don't care about who's building it behind the scenes. Definitely the not. only time you think about the engineer is when your computer stops working. So you are 100% right. When, as an engineer, you don't want to be known. Mm. Because when you are known, you are a terrible engineer, meaning you are designing bad products. Yeah. And people have to question you. But uh, again, I do not come from a privileged background. I came from a background where I need other young people to see me as an engineer. Not to so bored, not to kind of bitch my chest and say I can, but just to let my, uh, other young youngins, other young bloods that come from where I come from to say that, yo, if that kid from Albert Market can make it across the wall and do this. No, if the duty so, boy. If they would do it, can make it. Make it. Exactly. Me, yeah. Right. If they would do it, can become an engineer. Yeah. Why not me? Yeah. I, can, I can be it too, right? And, um, and I don't even take offense to this. And sometimes people will throw this kind of jobs at you. Haikiru Sehu, yes, I love that. Because if Haikiru Sehu can make it, and you know you are smarter than Sehu, yep. you are more probably physically more gifted than Sehu, why not you? Then you can do it too. So if you can use my success to motivate you and try to aspire and become better than me, I'm all for it, I love it. So that is the main, uh, that's my main motivation. It's not necessarily just kind of sober and put myself, uh, oh, I love the front line. No, we don't have that privilege of being on the background alone. We have to step up. We have to be on the front line to make sure that our youngins who do not have the opportunities that we don't have growing up, make sure that they see us as a role model. Make sure they see us as a role model. We're going to go into your writing skill. Mm -hmm. Do you see yourself as a writer? and a writer that will continue writing? Or is the testimony of an African immigrant just a testimony 
and that's the be it all and end it all. Um, I don't call myself a writer. I see myself as a storyteller, and I see myself as someone who had a story and how to tell it, and I just had to put it on paper this time. Maybe next time I could put it out on the audio format. Um, but I don't think this will be the last of uh, a book coming out of me, if per se, because I have a lot more stories to tell. Um, I'm from a continent that every day we surprise ourselves with new phenomena. Right? And as long as I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm also on the perpetual growth, it's not like I have, I'm looking for a destiny that when I get there, I'll be like, oh, I've arrived. I have arrived. I will never arrive where I'm trying to go to, right? Because where I'm going is perpetual. The, uh, the, you, no man will ever, ever be successful until the day you die. The day you die is when people are going to look at your life and reflect on your life and determine whether your life was worthwhile or not. But as long as you're in this world, you are always growing. And as long as there's life in you, God is never done with you yet. So I will continue uh, 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 writing. I, I'm not sure if everything that I write will make it out on paper. And another thing, the reason why I even like to call myself a writer or contemporary uh, writer is the fact that writing is very, very old. It has traditions, right? It has norms that you have to follow. And I feel like I'm from a millennial generation where I mean, we, don't, we say forget all of that, right? I don't have to be a Shakespearean to write a book. I have a story. I'm not saying that you should not aspire to be the best writer you could possibly be. But to say that I will not have a grammatical error in my book is the reason why I'm not, or afraid of been having grammatical errors is the reason why I'm not going to release a book. No, I don't have that fear, right? As long as I have a story to tell and I feel like I can articulate my story to inspire and motivate other people, I'll put out my story. I'll always aspire to improve my writing. Mm -hmm. I'll always aspire to make sure that I put out a very quality writing project. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I'm not uh, obsessed with, oh, these are the traditions of writing. And the reason why I also call it a testimony mm -hmm. uh, is the idea that I'm not supposed to, uh, by the culture of tra or the tradition of writing, who am I in my thoughts to say that I'm going to write a, uh, a, a manifesto about my life? What have I achieved? What have I done? Right? People usually wait like the, uh, the Kofi Annan, they wait mm -hmm. until the, uh, the tailgate or the twilight zone of their careers mm -hmm. for them to write books like that. So who are you to come in your thoughts and have done nothing and say you're going to write a, 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 your manifesto or what, some, no. Biography. Or some biography or some sort. So I feel like, okay, as a testimony, uh, you can give your testimony any day in, in your life. You can wake up to that room and say, today, this is my testimony for the whole day. This is how I live and this is how God has blessed I'm me. I'm looking forward and to your te uh, confessions. Right. I think that will be interesting <laughs> if you come with confessions. <laughs> we'll see. Let's see how much a good journalist you are there. Yeah. <laughs> but, I will want but, to see but, your but book yeah. confessions. Right. So that, that's the reason why I call it a testimony that, okay, mm -hmm. I can come up with a testimony any day. So next week, if I have a new testimony to give, Expect another book that's going to drop. But I'm working on a couple of other manuscripts that should be coming out very soon. Yeah. And we'll take our second break. When we come back, more with Seku Kamara. Young people, I mean, um, what we've seen is everybody points fingers at the adults and about everybody else not doing what they're supposed to do from our parents to our elders. And uh, what do you make of New Gambia and our young people? Um, Arun, I guess I will make a disclaimer before I move forward with this, because when you're about to make such statements, you got to make a disclaimer. I will say that um, uh, the Gambia, considering that over 60% of our population are under the age of 30 or some sort, um, it's an indictment on, upon us as a community that we don't have a plan or a concrete agenda for our young people. Mm -hmm. So I would put that out there and say that all of us, we ought to do better. Uh, but uh, like they say in Mandinka, um, young people uh, anywhere in this world, when you talk about change, is always led by young people. And change is not a willing uh, a thing that is given. Change comes from struggle, for the most part. And um, anywhere you travel around the world, uh, you talk about change, it's led by young people. But I really, in my own personal opinion, uh, to be honest with you, whether it is Gambia or other neighboring countries, 
I think my generation is the soft, uh, softest generation uh, that I've ever uh, probably read about or come across. Um, we are very entitled and then uh, we are very, very privileged at the same time. We have opportunities and we have things at our disposal that we don't need per se for anybody to help us, for us to do things that we need to do. But we still wait and keep on putting blame on other people, whether it is the baby boomers generation, whether it's the Generation X, or it is the government, or it is our uncle who live in Germany or Spain, uh, and whosoever we want to put the blame on, we put the blame on every single person except ourselves. We live in a generation where we now have a young, young people. They have no problem being on Facebook 24-7 while they can be on YouTube, learning skills or uh, new trades and talent added to their own toolbox that they can use and get themselves hired. I know young people who did not go to school to study videography and today they are very successful videographers around the world by simply self-training, self-taught, uh, self pretty much through YouTube. I know a lot of people who have never been to school to learn how to program. Uh, they study other disciplines, but today they are decent programmers because they self-taught themselves on how to write, be it C++, Java, or C Sharp, whatever it is, programming library. My point is, young people, we have opportunities. We have things that we can do on our own to uh, become successful. Uh, opportunity and success come to people, not those who wait, but those who create opportunities for themselves. Um, when you look throughout history, and looked at change, especially when you talk about political change, because a lot of time when people talk about young people being offered leadership opportunities in the Gambia, they usually, uh, one way or the other, allude to the fact of government not doing something, whether them getting positions in government or them getting a, a position in industry that government need to create for them. But let's look through history. Um, when in the case of the Gambia, it was Francis Moore. When this man started fighting and speaking against a colonial rule in the Gambia, he was in his 20s. This man was writing and preaching and fighting for independence in his 20s. When you go to in the case of Ghana, Kwame Kuruma was in his 20s when he first started his crusade for independent Africa and independent Ghana. Uh, when you go to all the way to America and you're talking about Martin Luther King, this dude was in his 20s, matter of fact, 26 years old when he led the march in Montgomery, Alabama, and was fighting for a... Uh, 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 equality and civil rights movement in America. Uh, when you talked about South Africa, Nelson Mandela, uh, this man was in his 20s when he first uh, founded the youth chapter of the ANC party while he was in school. Matter of fact, he got kicked out of school because of the very actions. And uh, we've been talking about Mahmoud Gandhi's of this world. When he started his known uh, violent movement while he was in South Africa at the time, during the apartheid period, he was in his 20s. And the most read political manifesto in this world today called the Communist Manifesto, written by two teenagers, uh, Karl Marx and his boy, they were in their 20s, As a matter of fact, 20, I believe 28 and 29 years old, respectively, some like that, a close uh, ballpark figure. So my point is, throughout history, when you looked at change, and when you took at great people and people who uh, aspire and inspire change, they were in their 20s. Young Gambians, in our 20s, what have we achieved? What have we done? Let's look at the Gambian struggle in itself, in entire, and let's be honest. Uh, last, last question. Right. This is the last one. The very last one, right. I promise you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have an audience with President Barrow, and okay. he says, okay, say who? I mean, you young men of this country, mm -hmm. it's, glad, it's good you're here. Mm -hmm. Some of you have skills, mm -hmm. have things. Um, if I have a puncture in my government, mm -hmm. where do you think this puncture is? And what can we do? How can we fix this? What will you tell them? See, now, the President Barrow, each government will not be a uh, silver bullet solution. It's not a single puncture. Like he said, he inherited a 22-year dictatorship, right? So you will not be a one-fix solution for the President Barrow. What I will offer President Barrow will be more like a generic advice that I would uh, advise any other person that will have been in his shoes today. I think President Barrow is given a unique opportunity that no other Gambian president, I hope that no other Gambian president will ever have again for the history of our nation. This uh, president literally had a free pass to do something that no Gambian president can ever do again. You inherited a dictatorship. You have an opportunity to serve one time. 
You are not looking for re-election. You are not looking to be liked by the voters anymore. You are not looking to, look to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to please the demos for any reason. Your job should be nation, country first, and nothing else. Focus on institutional reforms. Focus on policy reforms. That is your number one thing, strengthen our institutions. Because to do institutional reform in any third world country, Haruna, you're going to make a lot of enemies. No president will be electable without using some form of a, uh, 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 what they will call uh, benevolent dictatorial tendencies, like Rwanda. Paul Kigami is a great guy. I like the guy as a president, but I'm sometimes conflicted by his democratic principles as a Democrat, right? But in Africa, it's almost impossible for you to make certain institutional reforms and policy reforms and win political elections or really your population without having some of those benevolent uh, actions or uh, tendencies. So as a president, Barrow, you have an opportunity to do something because you don't care about re-election anymore. You're not trying to imp uh, impress somebody who get angry, who's going to bad mouth to a Sefo or an Alcalo. Or, no, what you're looking for is efficiency. Aruna, you can get the job done you in. You cannot do the job done you out. I'm not looking for you to like me or not like me. I have one time. I'm out of here. Let's get this work done. Let's bring policies that's going to safeguard our country 20, 30, 100 years from now. I'm going to make these policy reforms. Oh, you, this sector of the population don't like it, you'll be fine. We'll get over it. You're not going to vote for me, fine. I'm not looking for votes anyway. I don't have a political party. I'm not going to affect my political party, right? If you, if you have a political party, you are a president, now you're concerned. Even if you are out of office, you may affect the, uh, uh, the opportunity of the next guy behind you. So you always think in politics, but you are a coalition government. You are not worried about what the next party, what, uh, what your party, uh, uh, next uh, um, uh, uh, nominee or candidate from your party chances are going to be. You don't care because you are not a political party. You are a coalition government, all of you together, from you. So if you're hurting, everybody getting hurt. So if everybody getting hurt, you are equal opportunity offender to everybody. Focus on institutional reforms, focus on policy reforms, and call it a quid, and your job is done. Thank you very much, Seiko. We appreciate the time. Thank you very much. Good luck.